By now, you probably have heard about the absolute disaster that is Carvana. And if you haven't heard about it, don't worry. Let me bring you up to speed in under 30 seconds. Carvana is an online used car dealership and their entire shtick is that they have car vending machines. Over the last couple of years since COVID-19, Carvana has grown exponentially. The stock price went from being under $30 per share in March of 2020 to being over $360 per share in August of 2021. Despite the fact that they never had a profitable year, they've only had one profitable quarter and all in all, their financials are quite honestly a disaster. But of course, like many things, the success of Carvana was short-lived because as we see here today, they're cutting employees, their stock price is tanking, and things don't look good. Okay, that covers it. But for real, Carvana is simply a used car dealership marketing themselves as a tech company while also marketing themselves as a car vending machine. And all in all, over the last couple of months, people have been taking off their rose colored glasses and they've been viewing Carvana for what they actually are, which is a giant scam. So in this video, what I wanna talk about is why Carvana is a giant scam and what's behind all of the negative news that you've heard about the company lately. And we're gonna do this by covering four main points. First and foremost, we're gonna talk about the founder, Ernest Garcia III, as well as his father, Ernest Garcia II, because they play a major, major role in this scam. Number two is we're gonna talk about timing in the pandemic and how these two things played their role in this Carvana scheme. Number three, we're gonna be talking about how Carvana makes their money and some of the major red flags that are associated with that. And last but certainly not least, we're gonna be talking about how all of this ties up together to create the scam of the decade. Now, Carvana was founded by Ernest Garcia III, but who I wanna focus on right now isn't the founder and CEO. Instead, it's his dad, Ernest Garcia II. Ernest Garcia II is the founder and CEO of Drive Time Automotive, which is the fourth largest used car retailer in the United States. Now, if you look up Ernest Garcia II online, you'll find a handful of different things about him, but the thing that he's most notoriously known for, other than his involvement in Carvana, is a wiring fraud scheme that he pled guilty to in 1990. He ended up being charged with wiring fraud and was sentenced to probation, but never served any actual jail time. He then founded Drive Time shortly after in 1992, and his son, Ernest Garcia III, worked for Drive Time from 2007 until he went full-time with Carvana in 2013. Now, Drive Time, Ernest Garcia III's company, and Carvana, Ernest Garcia II's company, these two companies are supposedly completely separate and have been operating as two different companies. But it is important to note that Carvana was actually created as a subsidiary to Drive Time, but was later spun off into its own thing. Now, Carvana was founded in 2012, and in the early years, Carvana definitely wasn't as well known as it is today. And honestly, in doing research for this video, I wasn't able to find anything super noteworthy about the company between 2012 and 2019, other than their IPO in 2017. I would say other than their IPO, the most notable thing was that they created a fully automated vending machine in Nashville, Tennessee, where you put a coin into the vending machine and then it would dispense you the car that you just bought. But other than that marketing shtick, there just wasn't a whole lot going on. Between 2012 and 2019, nothing super noteworthy happened in the news about Carvana. They were just kind of plugging away. Things were happening behind the scenes, but we will definitely talk about that a bit later. But of course, then 2020 came and the pandemic and COVID-19, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to Carvana, which totally makes sense if you think about it, because at this time, people were having to shift to a contactless form of doing business. So dealerships, which were once a very personable experience of shaking hands, talking in an office, going on a test drive, that had to shift virtually overnight. And dealerships were left with the question of, well, what do we do now? How do we do our business in a contactless way? And Carvana was already ahead of the game because they were already doing online deliveries. They were already selling cars online. So pivoting into this new COVID era was something that Carvana really actually didn't have to pivot into at all. They were already set up for this and so they were really able to capitalize off of it. As a result, Carvana absolutely exploded. Carvana went from having a revenue of 3.94 billion in 2019 to 5.59 billion in 2020, all the way to 12.8 billion in 2021. Though Carvana has never had a profitable year, they did have their very first profitable quarter in Q2 of 2021, but then shortly after that, their profits sunk once again. Carvana operated on the idea that scale was the secret sauce of what was missing in their business model. Scale was the reason why their business wasn't profitable. 
But this was put to the test in 2020 and 2021, and it was proven to not be the case in the case of Carvana. I mentioned a few moments ago that Carvana has only had one profitable quarter, and that was Q2 of 2021. But other than this one single quarter, Carvana isn't a profitable company, and they never have been. Now, that in itself isn't a huge red flag. Like, it's certainly not good, but it's not as rare as you may think. In fact, big tech companies that you and I know of on an everyday basis are also not profitable. Airbnb isn't considered a profitable company and neither is Uber. But the big difference with Carvana is the fact that they should be making a profit with their business model. What I mean by this is that business model is similar to Carvana. It's not abnormal to see years and years of losses, especially if sales volume is low. But we were really able to see and put Carvana's business model to the test in 2020 and 2021, where sales volume were at record numbers. If we look at Carvana's P&L, you can see that their losses at the end of the year are still astronomical, despite the fact that their revenue has increased by more than 12 times what it was back in 2017. If Carvana's business model actually worked, they should have been able to decrease costs, but they weren't able to. This is because for every single car that Carvana sells, they actually lose money on that car and scale isn't gonna make a difference here. This indicates that there is something fundamentally wrong in Carvana's business structure. Carvana has something seriously wrong and scale isn't gonna help them. But the thing is, is that Carvana's lack of cash and also lack of profitability isn't even their biggest problem to date. The biggest problem and the absolutely massive red flag associated with Carvana is with how they actually make most of their money, which actually doesn't come from the sale of vehicles. Instead, it comes from the financing of vehicles. Carvana relies on finance and insurance for 50% of their gross margin, according to their own P&L. And their biggest contributor to Carvana's gross profit is called gain on loan sales. What this means is that Carvana actually isn't making their money off of the actual sale of the vehicle. Instead, it's made from financing that vehicle for their budget buyer, and then it's also off of the sale of that debt to a debt investor. Now, the idea of using loans and financing as a major revenue stream for a dealership, that isn't the problem here. In fact, that's pretty standard practice in the world of dealers. Financing is a huge revenue stream. But the problem with Carvana specifically is the types of loans that they're giving out, the way in which they finance their cars, as well as how they classify these loans on their financial statements. Now, Carvana makes a lot of their money off of financing vehicles for buyers, but the bulk of their loans that they offer to borrowers are in the form of securitized subprime auto loans. Now, if the term securitized subprime loan sounds familiar to you, there is good reason for that. And that is because of the fact that subprime loans are a big reason as to why the economy collapsed in 2008. Now, a securitized auto loan is an auto loan that is arranged between the lender, in this case Carvana, and the borrower, in this case the vehicle buyer. And once Carvana and this borrower finalize that deal, the debt is then sold to a debt investor. So Carvana takes the debt out of their hands and they sell it to an investor that is now responsible for that debt. In the case of Carvana, Carvana finances about 80% of all of the cars that they sell on their platform. So the idea behind securitized auto loans is that Carvana arranges these auto loans, they get the financing done for their borrowers, and then they then sell that debt to another debt investor. And this is an additional revenue stream for Carvana. Here we can check out a breakdown of the different loans that Carvana has offered in the past. And if you take a look at this sheet, you may notice that a large number of these loans that Carvana issues to borrowers are actually subprime loans. These are loans given with poor terms to less than great borrowers who are typically unqualified for the loan that they're getting. Subprime loans are riskier to the lender because of the fact that they're going to somebody with either bad credit or poor credit or somebody that may be on the fence of qualifying for that car at all. As a result of this higher risk borrower, they oftentimes have to pay an insanely high interest rate. In the case of Carvana, sometimes these interest rates are as high as 20%. 20% for an auto loan. That's like credit card level interest. Now, the appeal of a subprime loan from a lender's perspective is the fact that a prime loan, which is somebody with a qualified credit history, though they are the safest investment for a lender, they're also the least profitable. On the flip side, a subprime borrower is a high profit, but also high risk borrower. You're paying an insanely high interest and thus you're making a lot of money off of it, but the risk of that borrower not paying back the loan at all and thus you having to repo the car, that's definitely a risk you're gonna have to take. But the idea is from a lender's perspective, 
is that as long as you have enough prime borrowers to even out the subprime borrowers, then you'll be fine. Now, the idea of securitized subprime loans in the context of Carvana is the fact that Carvana sells these cars to subprime borrowers. They set them up with subprime lending. And then once the deal is closed, Carvana then sells that subprime debt to a debt investor. Thus, the debt is off of their hands and Carvana doesn't have to worry about it any longer. These loans are classified as tranches, and in the case of Carvana, it's in the form of auto loans. Whenever Carvana goes and sells this debt to an investor, they'll typically pull hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loans together and then sell it as a package in the form of a tranche. This is, of course, in theory, a really big win for Carvana because of the fact that they have a buyer for their car, they've arranged the financing for the car, they've taken on a high-risk borrower, but they ultimately don't have to deal with that because now it's in the hand of an investor. The problem though, is that Carvana isn't selling a chunk of these loans like they should be. Instead, they're holding on to them. Now, over the last 24 months, holding on to high risk subprime loans hasn't really been an issue for Carvana because of the fact that car prices are at all time highs and thus people aren't going delinquent on their car loans. Additionally, people have cash in their pocket from stimulus money and thus they have extra money to spend. It's been a really good two years for Carvana. And thus, Carvana has not only been able to hold on to these high-risk loans in a relatively safe manner, but they've also been able to sell these loans to investors for an extremely high price. But the problem is the economy is shifting. Stimulus money has stopped, car prices are lowering, and it's not a matter of if they're going to go down dramatically, but simply a matter of when. And as we sit here today in May of 2022, we are already starting to see an increase in delinquency rates for auto loans. This is going to be an absolute huge game changer for not only Carvana's biggest revenue stream, which is the business of selling subprime auto loans, but it's also going to be an issue with the loans that they're currently holding on to, because it's not a matter of if people are going to begin to default fault on their loans. It's simply a matter of when it's going to start. The last 24 months have created an absolute perfect environment for Carvana to thrive. In fact, I would argue you couldn't have asked for a better set of circumstances, but the environment has shifted and we are beginning to go back to reality. And as a result, the dominoes of Carvana are beginning to fall and we're already beginning to see the effects of that. One thing I do have to mention that I don't really know where else to fit it in this video, but I can't not mention it, is the $2.2 billion acquisition of Adessa auction locations. Adessa is an auction company and Carvana Carvana purchased their physical locations for $2.2 billion on May 10th of this year. The exact same day that they announced 2,500 people or 12% of their workforce was going to be laid off. Now, the exact reason why Carvana purchased Odessa is definitely up for debate. If you were to take Carvana's word, it would be to expand their foothold into the used car industry by going into auction, refurbishing, fixing vehicles, and thus being able to sell cars with a higher margin. But there is definitely a debate on whether that actually is true, and a lot of industry experts believe that Carvana purchasing Odessa is basically their way of trying to squeeze a profit out of something. If Carvana can't be profitable with their current business model, let's pivot and shift to a different business model that we can hopefully turn a profit from. Now, the acquisition of Odessa for the purpose of this video isn't really super substantial to the overall tone of this video, but I do think that it will play an important role into Carvana in the future, which is why I'm mentioning here. Now, one of the weirdest and definitely the biggest red flag for Carvana is the way in which the company is structured and how it is set and structured to benefit Ernest Garcia II and Ernest Garcia III, which is Carvana's CEO and his father. Now, traditionally, whenever a company goes public, it goes from being a private company where it's controlled by the executives or the owner, and then it goes into being a publicly traded company where it is now controlled by the shareholders. And shareholders have voting power whenever it comes to the decisions that that company makes. That's whenever it comes to shareholder votes, shareholder meetings, different disclosures, things like that. So with this in mind, if you owned 100 shares, you'd have more voting power than somebody that owned 10 shares. If you owned 1,000 shares, you'd have more voting power than somebody that owned 100, and so on and so forth. Now, the way in which voting power is determined is, of course, a bit different from company to company, but in general, that's typically how it's laid out. But this is not laid out in the case of Carvana. In a quote taken by a Wharton School accounting professor named Daniel Taylor, he stated, the existing structure of Carvana has allowed for them, being the Garcias, to run this $60 billion company as if it's a family firm for the family benefit. And the way in which they accomplished this was by outlining their own rules with their SEC filing whenever Carvana went public. This right here is a filing that was submitted whenever Carvana went public in 2017. And you can see here that it says, Carvana company has two authorized classes of common stock, class A and class B. Holders of the class A common stock are entitled to one vote per share. 
Ernest Garcia II and Ernest Garcia III and entities controlled by one or both of them, collectively the Garcia parties, are entitled to 10 votes per share of Class B common stock they beneficially own for so long as the Garcia parties maintain in the aggregate direct or indirect beneficial ownership of at least 25% of the outstanding shares of Class A common stock. It then goes on to say that all other holders of Class B common stock are each entitled to one vote per share. All holders of Class A and Class B common stock will vote together as a single class except otherwise required by applicable law. So while normal shareholders and investors like me and you and anybody else who wants to invest in Carvana have one vote per share that they own, the Garcias have 10. They outnumber the average investor 10 to one. This means that Ernest Garcia II and Ernest Garcia III can basically do whatever they want with Carvana because of the fact that they hold the vast majority of voting power with the company. Another major issue with Carvana has been some serious allegations of insider trading. Over the last roughly two years, Ernest Garcia II has sold nearly $4 billion worth of stock. And according to an article that I found online, Ernest Garcia II had access to private shares that were being sold at a steep discount during the beginning of COVID-19. This meant that he was able to get his hands on an absolute ton of stock at a discounted rate that wasn't accessible and available to the general public. And then just a few short years later, the stock price went to $360 per share. Of course, shareholders were not happy about this and they have since filed a lawsuit against Carvana, but it is still pending. But one of the sketchiest things about Ernest Garcia II buying these shares is the way in which he's doing it. You see, executives or significant shareholders of a company have the ability to plan out when they're going to buy or sell stocks. This is something called a 10B5-1 plan. And this is a plan that's outlined in advance. And basically what it does is outline when you're going to sell or buy stock. This is a great way for executives to be able to still cash out of stock, but to have it not raise any eyebrows that something may be going on. It's also a way to safeguard insider trading trading. Typically, an executive would lay out a plan in advance, and then that plan would be executed on automatically in the following years. But in the case of Carvana and Ernest Garcia II, that's not exactly what happened. So over the course of roughly two years, between March of 2020 and December of 2021, Ernest Garcia II was executing his 10B5-1 plan. And through this plan, he sold roughly $4 billion worth of stock. The problem though, is that he was actively modifying and adjusting this plan throughout this two year period of time which pretty much defeats the entire purpose. Ernest Garcia II purchased Carvana shares heavily in March of 2020 and through the early months of the pandemic. He then modified his 10B5-1 plan in June of 2020, and then in November, the plan started automatically selling 30,000 shares per day for the entire month of November. Then on November 4th, 2020, he modified his plan once again, and on December 2nd, 2020, a month later, he sold $478 million worth of shares. For the rest of the month in December, he sold roughly 50,000 shares per day day while the stock was sitting at about $250 per share. Then in May of 2021, he modified his plan once again. This time, the stock price of Carvana was sitting at about $300 per share, and he ended up selling about 60,000 shares per day throughout the summer. In addition to this, whenever Carvana went public, they ended up implementing something called a tax receivables agreement. Basically what this is in a really oversimplified situation is an agreement that is met between an early investor of a company and the company itself. And in the case of Carvana, it means that tax assets can be used by the company to reduce future tax bills. But according to the agreement, early investors will receive most of the value from that tax asset. In the case of Carvana specifically, whatever tax benefit Carvana receives from these assets, they have to pay 85% of that value to its early investors. In this case, under this agreement, Ernest Garcia II would stand to make about $1 billion from this tax agreement. Now, I could go on and on and on talking about the shady dealings of Carvana and Ernest Garcia II. And to be honest, whenever I was doing research for this video, I had a really hard time figuring out what I wanted to keep in and what I needed to take out for the sake of time and clarity. But trust me, there is quite a lot more. But it does cover the meat of it all, and it does give you a pretty decent idea of what is going behind the scenes of Carvana and what could ultimately be the reason behind why this company is now falling apart. At the end of the day, Carvana is a structurally unsound company that makes its money and gets its revenue from car loans. 
In my last video that I made about Carvana, I had described Carvana as a used car dealer masquerading as a tech company. And in reality, what Carvana actually is, is a used car loan originator disguised as a car dealer masquerading as a tech company. Carvana is a publicly traded company that is controlled by Ernest Garcia II with the help of his son and CEO, Ernest Garcia III. The company is unprofitable with no real signs of profitability in the far or near future. But to be honest, that's totally okay because to Ernest Garcia II and Ernest Garcia III, that's not really what matters. Carvana was created to benefit the Garcia family with their own personal interest in mind over any shareholder, any company, any investor. And this is solidified in the SEC filing that gives them a 10 to one voting power. It doesn't matter that the state of Illinois has revoked their dealer's license. It also doesn't matter that used car loans are beginning to go into default, potentially leaving Carvana holding the bag of millions of dollars of debt. Because at the end of the day, Carvana did exactly what it was supposed to do. It benefited Ernest Garcia II, Ernest Garcia III, and their family. And at the end of the day, the Garcia family will have made billions of dollars once all that's left is a bankrupt company and a worthless stock. Smoke and mirror financial statements allowed for Carvana to get pretty far. Sneaky SEC filings allowed for the Garcia family to maintain control of a publicly traded company. And COVID-19 and the pandemic skyrocketed this company to make mainstream media turning it into a Wall Street darling. But the fact is, all of this can only go on for so long. And at the end of the day, Carvana is a structurally unsound company and it is an absolute scam. But like always, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. And I will see you guys in the next video.